We're in a world right now that's intensely competitive. It has never been so competitive, right? So you might as well like be as true to yourself and specialize as soon as you can, because down the line, that is probably gonna serve you best. On today's segment, we'll be highlighting some of the most valuable sections of Carlos Alonso Torres' podcast on Demo Day. Carlos shares his advice to young people about to start their career, how to prevent layoffs in a company and the green flags in a startup founder that VCs want to invest in. Without further ado, let's jump into Demo Day. I think definitely there's a cultural element to entrepreneurship in the US. Um, you know, I think, I, well, one, I mean, I think literally it's easier to build a company in this in this country. I think it's, it's, it's a big part of the identity um, and the government, I think, makes it easier to do so. In other countries, there's more regulation, mm, more red tape. Because like more, taxes and like things, they yeah, make exactly. it very uh, incentivized it, to, to start or run a business. For sure, right? Like, you know, when I was an operator, right, before I began investing, right, I was actually living in Colombia. I helped build a business in Colombia. Wow. And there, you know, fire severance, right, for employees that you want to, you know, terminate the contract for, et cetera. Like it's, it's a very complex process. It's very expensive to do so. So all these type of things, right? Like all these protectionist measures that some governments have, you know, in, in a way, right, of course, increase the comfort, right, of the of the population as far as their job protection, et cetera. But at the same time, it, it, it makes it significantly harder to be able to build a company more more smoothly, no? Um, the access to capital in the US, of course, much bigger. There's many more pools of investors that you can tap into. And I think all these things, and the access to talent, right? So I think all these things make a difference. That's why you have so many people in the US building businesses. And now, you know, I just, before talking about microfinance and, you know, starting to get into the world of this micro fund, which I, I would love to learn more about, how do you recommend in your own experience, leveraging that university to the best of your ability? Because I, I think that, you know, so often we forget about how many resources are at our disposal at university. Um, what was your experience like? I know you said you were very close with your uh, people on your floor. How did you take them? take advantage of that? Or how, how did you um, get the most value out of maintaining those relationships when you were in school? So maybe I'll answer the question in two ways. One is as far as relationships. The other one is as far as sort of taking advantage of resources. Yeah, please. Um, I mean, in terms of relationships, I think it's actually, it's interesting because I honestly, like it's the people that you, it's the people that you enjoy hanging out with, right? At the end of the day, fundamentally, right? And Later, we can talk about how this relates to venture capital, but it's just building human relationships now. So when you're 18, you don't know who's going to do what really. People really change their minds. But I think if you find people that are very akin to you, and if you find people especially that are hardworking, sort of, you know, pursuing different interests that, that you know, are provocative or even different, right? And sort of pushing the envelope in that sense, then those are pretty interesting people to be with because chances are those are early signs of how they will pursue their careers and how they will try to do interesting things, right? Um, you know, in that environment, of course, you know, there's sometimes you want, to, you want to be cool. So you hang out with the people that party the most, et cetera. Chances are that they might not be the people that build the most interesting things when you, when you leave that environment though. You know, at least with like my younger, my younger brother, his friends that are, you know, 22, 24, 26, there's this feeling like I have to have it all figured out. I have to do every little thing just perfect. What, what do you have to tell, you know, the 21 or the 22 year olds, you know, through your own lens, you know, having been through that journey, do you have any advice? Would you have done it the same way? You know, what do you recommend others think about as they're in that same position? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I, I don't have regrets. I think, you know, I, I, I learned a lot where I was. Uh, I, I certainly was in situations of stress management that I think taught me a lot for, for the future. Um, yeah. And I just had to think very fast. So I think that those were all good, you know, they were good exercises for things to come. But my advice to younger people is don't be, maybe be as sincere as you can with yourself from an early age. Um, sometimes when you're, when you're quite young and even honestly, pe some people never change this, right? Like you are, you know, you're inclined to make certain decisions because of what you see around yourself, because what is prestigious, because what can enable you to have a certain lifestyle, et cetera. Right. Yeah. Um, these are all factors that as humans and in society, right? Like we're susceptible to, but at the end of the day, right. I think that like, if you, if you become very good at something, you will make money and you will have a promising career. 
we're in a world right now that's ex that's in intensely competitive. It has never been so competitive, right? And especially because of things like Zoom that are enablers, but also you know mean that people from different parts of the world can try to pursue yeah, a job opportunity that you have. Absolutely. So you might as well like be as true to yourself and specialize as soon as you can, because down the line that is probably going to serve you best. Some people take longer than others, but you but having I think that mental framework or at least trying to pursue that objective is 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 a good way to go. Let's talk about, you know, firing or laying off or, you know, I know now there's a lot of different more politically correct names. I wanted to kind of address it uh more from like things that you learned, you know, through those experiences. What were some of the things that you did wrong when firing in the early days that you then were able to adjust and feel like you're able to do better now? What yeah. were some mistakes early on that founders could learn from because yeah. firing employees is part of the game, um, especially when you have the right process in place, it's even in some cases best for both, for, you know, for both parties. So what were some of like yeah. the, the mistakes you made? Yeah. And then maybe what some of the things you learned from those mistakes that you now are able to bring into your, you know, more modern day life. The main mistake is don't, don't hire too fast. Like take, take your time. That's going to minimize the possibility, the probability of you having to fire people. Um, if you over hire, especially relative to your revenue growth, right? You know, it's it 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 can be it can be difficult. Um, or if you overhire without having enough sensitivity of the culture that you're trying to build. Like it 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 it's it shouldn't be let me put it this way, it shouldn't be understanding how much the culture of a company changes when you go from like 10 to 30 employees or from 30 to like 80. It becomes a very different place. You have like little subcultures that form in different parts of the organization. And all these things like, you know, from, from a human management perspective, right, add complications. So if you're going to put the organization through that stress, which eventually you will have to, you have to be sure, one, that you have competent managers that are going to be able to do so effectively and, and that are aligned with the people, you know, at, at the very top, so to speak, whether the founders or the C-suites or whatever you want to call it. And two, that these people actually like will fit into the, the organization and will perform at the level of rigor that you that you expect which oftentimes is easier, much easier said than done. That is uh, for sure accurate. And so as you progress through this business, I know you were using the analogy of, you know, as you go from five employees to 30 to 80, um, was that part of your journey? Did your company see those sorts of, you know, growth and growing stages? Or did you get to a certain point where you sort of hit a ceiling and that kind of led to your next journey from there? We hired very fast, too fast. Um, you know, we were trying to scale to different cities. So we hired managers for the, the, the main, the main four cities in the country. Those people were then hiring teams underneath them. Mm -hmm. And we took some of those decisions prematurely where we were still like having to see more of a product market fit to justify that. Um, and then when it came to, when it came to fundraising or at, at times we realized our burn was too high. Um, and we had to, and we had to make, and we had to make cuts, right? Um, and the impact of that in the organization was was tough because I think we were very part of the of the culture we were we were building. We actually hired a lot of people from underrepresented groups, whether ethnically or gender wise, et cetera, like within the country. Relative to a typical Colombian company, we looked very very different, um, and we were very proud of that. So I think that created an air, an, an air of excitement that you know when we had to do when we had to do layoffs it you know it, it, it was it was hard to overcome it's tough yeah yeah one of my approaches was like if we're gonna have to hire people that have the right but the mix of the right knowledge but also the mindset to go into such a risky venture and that they're not going to be either too slow to operate or overwhelmed by the sheer immensity of what we're doing then it has to be people that probably would not you know that 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 are prepared for this, but would not receive a safer opportunity somewhere else. So I, I precisely one of the reasons why we were so diverse is because I said, okay, these people unfortunately probably are hidden talents that are not going to be discovered by more traditional enterprises mm -hmm. or won't be given a chance that have the so, right mindset. That have the right mindset, and precisely because they won't be given so many chances at more traditional places, they are I think more inclined to actually consider less traditional options, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that worked very well for us. And then that formed networks. For example, I hired one of, one of the first people I hired uh, was the head of analytics, a guy called Carlos Mario, who came from Chocó, which is the most impoverished region of Colombia. Uh, he's he's Afro-Colombian. Um, he was the best hire I've ever done in my life. He then 
we were able to tap into that network of his community in Medellin, people from that region. And we actually made more hires from there because apparently there were these very talented people, a lot of which were not being given opportunities in more traditional enterprises, so to speak. So those kind of things actually worked, like uh, 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 maybe accessing networks that were less tapped by by more traditional companies, basically. One of the pieces of advice we've gotten on this podcast before that I think is really interesting is, you know, a lot of people think that they have to they have to wait until they get to a fund or a big fund before they can start being an investor. And oftentimes learning how to do due diligence, learning how to meet the right people, learning how to source deals and pass them on, all things you can do from the college dorm or the college university or even just your own apartment. Um, and so, you know, as you were starting to go through this like early, you know, part of really reaching out, what sort of advice would you give others to try to get them into a position to become a VC, right? Because there's, it's, it's such a big, hot topic right now. There's so many people that want to get into VC, but they don't know exactly how, what, yeah. what recommendations do you have? What advice do you have? There's, I guess, two main things. One is if you have had experience building a business for early stage VC, what I do at least like seed series A, I think if you have had experience building a business that puts you in a very good position to become, to become a VC, because you know what it takes mm -hmm. and there's that empathy and not only that, but also there's the, there's the street cred aspect of it where like, I think a founder sees you differently if you have been in his shoes or her shoes before, right? Quite frankly, I think there's that. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is more like along the lines of what you're saying, I think, look, like thematically speaking, if you gather your thoughts on a space, you understand the landscape, you understand the regulation around it, if that's relevant, you understand what has happened there and who the main players are. I think that that that, that is a big part of the work that you do as a VC. Right. So if you're speaking to a fund, I mean, let me put it this way. If you speak to, if, if I'm interviewing someone and I ask them about a, a certain area that they're passionate about, right? It's a typical question that comes up in a VC interview mm -hmm. and they give me some nuanced thought and they maybe even mention startups that I don't even know that are in the space or I haven't, or they tell me about startups that I've heard of, but, and I think are interesting, but I haven't had the time to meet yet. That is the best impression you can possibly yeah, it make. Like, it like something happens in here. You're like, ooh, like I, this person yeah. is like, there, there's depth yeah. to it. Well, this person can be a, like a thought partner, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that's, yeah. So I think that that's a very important part. Like the due diligence, uh, you know, obviously the access to capital to invest that comes from when you're, when you're within a fund, right? The due diligence too, and you can learn from people that are already doing the job on how to do it. All, all that I think is, honestly, to me is, is less important than actually being very passionate about a space and having thoughts and perspectives on it and where it's going. I think at the end of the day, VC that like, if you have a space that you think is interesting, then it's your ability to actually, and your instinct to find people within that space that can execute the idea. Right. Yeah. But you need to have an, a, an idea of the bearings and where you're going. Well, you know, that's, I think a good segue into the bearings and, and sort of what you look for in founders you invest in. Obviously, from your experience working in LATAM, I'm sure you have like an acute ability to kind of tap under the hood of where they from, what their background, what their mindset is. What are some of the other things that you're looking for? The other, um, let's call it green flags where you're like, mm, I really like this founder. What, yeah. what sort of traits do they exhibit? There has to be a very fine line between perseverance and open-mindedness. I think a, an excellent founder is the person that is extremely hardworking and is very committed to what they're doing and the vision that they're pursuing. But at the same time, they keep an open mind and they keep their head up and they're looking around themselves. Yes. Right? Because when someone is a machine, so to speak, and is executing very well, but that means sort of that they put their blinders on, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're so focused on the task at hand that can be dangerous because there might be an interesting opportunity or a pivot point or whatever you want to call it down, you know, along the path that they miss because they just didn't have their head up, right? At the same time, you don't want to invest in someone that has their head up all the time and is not actually executing, right? And they're going to too many conferences or they're doing too many talks or constantly redefining the idea of what they're doing. Like there has to be a level of conviction where they say that, you know, this is where we're going. Yes. And, and no journey is linear, right? So I think that the people that are able to do what I'm saying, which is with you know it, it's not a perfect science right like some people exhibit it to different degrees but the people that can really do this are the people that end up being able to to see you know to to per, to go down the line of this unlinear path right with all the bumps in between but get to a get to an endpoint that is that is very promising 
Carlos, uh, again, such an honor and pleasure to have you on Demo Day today. Uh, for those listening at home that are you know, in the fintech, the banking, the DeFi, the crypto uh, spaces, where can they connect with you? What's the best place for them to connect? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, they can either reach out via via LinkedIn um, or if not, even even my email. It's carlos at fintech.io. So, you know, of course, sometimes I, I'm slower to reply than I wish, but, you know, I, I'll do I will do my best. Carlos, you're the man. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us today. Thank you very uh, much. Everyone watching at home or listening from a car or wherever the heck you are, uh, thank you so much. Everyone, I'm Sean Goldfaden, founder of Coefficient Labs. This is Demo Day. Peace, guys. Yeah.